are in the final week of our series on the end times. And uh, I want to encourage you today, okay, follow along. Uh, you'll see there's the scan code right there to my left, your right. If you are watching online, it'll be right below me. It's going to show up. You scan that. That's going to send you to a place where you can take notes. you got to take notes because here's what we're going to do today. We are going to start in Revelation 1, and we're going to go from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22. All right? And that's a lot of chapters. And we're going to go there, and we're going to try to do it fast. And so you stick with me. You write some things down. I've been saying for several weeks now that the stuff that you will hear may seem a little bit strange, maybe a little bit weird. And if you thought it was strange and if you thought it was weird, get ready. Because today is going to be even stranger, weirder, okay? Uh, we're going to hear things like the sky is going to, it's going to rain with fire. We're going to talk about angels that spit swords and we're going to talk about demons and beasts and plagues and uh, all, just all kinds of stuff. It's weird stuff, but it's true stuff. It's all in the word of God. And I know sometimes when we think about revelation, it's, it's hard to understand. Maybe some of you might even be a little bit uh but like like this anxious about this like how, how many of you would honestly say when you read revelation or you hear it about it, it it's a little bit scary to you is anybody you would yeah yeah thank you for being honest yeah it, it, it can be a little bit scary and it's not meant to be in, in in fact it's meant to be a blessing it's meant to be a blessing i'll show you this in revelation the very first chapter of revelation i want you to understand what Revelation is all about and, and what it's meant to be. In verse 3, this is what Scripture says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Think about that. You're blessed. You're blessed when you read it. Out loud, you're blessed when you hear it, you, you're blessed when you keep it. And there's, there's, there's no other book in, in the scriptures, in, in the Bible, there's no other book of the Bible that promises that kind of thing, that, that kind of blessing. So Revelation, when you read it and you study it, there, there's something that comes from it. And so listen, this is going to be uh, like, you know, like you're drinking from a fire hydrant. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you a lot. We're going to read a lot of scripture today. I'm going to give you a lot of high points. My challenge to you is go back and read it. And, and I, I want to invite you to, instead of using a digital version, use the pages. Use the pages and, and circle things and highlight things. If you will read it, if you're a slow reader like me, it'll take you about an hour, a little bit over an hour to read. All right. Some of you fast readers, you can read it in a lot, um, you know, a lot quicker than that. But I want to encourage you to read it. And this is my aim for today. My aim is to strengthen your faith. My aim is to try to bring you some some comfort with these words, because these are words that God. Listen to me now. God gave Jesus these words for you. If you don't believe me. Um, open up your Bible, go to Revelation. This is not going to be on the screen. It's not in your notes, but if you go to Revelation's chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants. God gave this to Jesus to give to us. So that's what it's all about today. My goal is to, um, is to strengthen our faith to help us know that Jesus is coming, the time is near, and as Christians, we're to be excited. There, there should, like, excitement should just fill your soul and your, your heart about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I've been practicing this, and I'm going to try to say it, and we're going to say it all together, but I want you to say with me, um, um, Apocalypsis. Um, Apocalypsis. Okay? Apocalypsis. We'll say it one more time. 
apocalypsis. Okay, so that, that is, that is the Greek word for revelation. It, it's also the word where we get apocalypse from in English. Some people will refer to revelation as uh, the apocalypse of John. When you think about revelation, there's a lot of mystery around it, but it's not meant to be. In fact, what that word means is an uncovering. It's to uncover. It's to reveal. That's what revelation. And notice I didn't say revelations. There's no S. It's just one revelation, and the revelation is Jesus. When you read revelation, you read it with Jesus in mind, all the way from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22. It's all Jesus, every bit of it. Everybody always asks, what's the big deal about Jesus? Listen, everything's about Jesus. The whole thing is about Jesus. This was written by a disciple of Jesus by the name of John. You remember, now there were 12 disciples, okay? One of them, one of them died. Um, he killed himself because he, what did he do? He betrayed Jesus, okay? The other 10, they died a martyr's death. They died for standing up for the cause of Christ. They died. This is amazing because the, 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 if you read their story and you hear how they died, they died and they, they, they wouldn't deny Jesus. Why? Because they saw him. They saw his resurrected body. They knew he was alive. They were willing to die for what they knew was true. There was another one, though. His name was John. He did not die. John lived during um, the reign of a very, very evil dictator. And it was along about 95, 96 AD when Revelation was written, and it was written because John stood up to this guy. He wanted everybody to worship him. Worship me as God, as, as Lord. And John said, no, I'm not going to do it. And so he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And there... There we know that he received this, this, um, this vision, this angel came to him, and he revealed to him the things that we're going to read about in Revelation. Revelation is a series of letters. It's a series of letters that were written to different churches in the Asia Minor. And so all these letters are put together, and they all point to the, to the end times. And so what I want to do today is I want to, I, I want to split this up, and the sections, and I, I want to try to help you understand when you read a section, what are you looking for? And I think if you can, if you can understand in each section what that section is about, you will understand more uh, about the revelation. You'll understand more about what you're reading. Okay, so there's a few sections, so we're going to go through it very quickly. Are you ready? Are ready? Okay, so here we go. I hope you're taking notes. We're, we're going to divide this up. The, the very first section that we're going to divide this up into is Revelation chapter 1 through chapter 3. So chapter 1 through chapter 3. And this is what I want you to see, because remember, we're looking at this through, the, uh, we're looking at this through Jesus. It's, it's all about Jesus. And I want you to see Jesus as the returning king. Revelation 1 through chapter 3, Jesus is the returning king. Now, this is a vision that John receives, and look what he says in chapter 1. We'll, we'll begin there. We'll read this together. Uh, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Okay, even those. They're going to see him. And all the tribes of the earth will well on account of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, John is describing Jesus. This is who Jesus is. This is what we're talking about. Remember this, the, um, the chart that we've put up? This is not the first coming of Jesus. This is the second coming. And we know that when Jesus comes a second time, what's going to happen? He, you know, the tribulation has happened. 
Jesus is going to put an end to that, and we're going to have a millennial reign. So Jesus, he's coming the second time, and he's stating here that I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha being the first letter of, of the Greek alphabet, and Omega being the last letter of the Greek alphabet. He's saying, I am the first, and I am the last. That, that is Jesus. Uh, it, he goes on to describe what he saw. Verse 14 says this, The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like uh, brownished bronze, refined in, in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a, a sharp two-edged sword. Now, let's, let's stop for just a moment and think about it. Um, he held stars in his hands. Like, what, what does that mean? What does that look like to hold stars? There's symbolism here, okay? It's a lot of symbolism as you read. The, as you keep going down in chapter 1, you will see that you'll find out that these stars are actually angels. That's the imagery here. There are seven angels. And when he says, um, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, what's he talking about? What is the two-edged sword? What is sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God. The Bible says, And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Verse 17, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. That is the gospel. The gospel message. You'll see the gospel message throughout Revelation. And he says, I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus. He's the key to it all. He's got it all. It's interesting that John, now remember John, when you read the gospel of John, John is the one who kept referring to himself as uh, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. He just loves him. Like they had a, a different, they seemed to have a different relationship. He would recline with him, and when he would recline with him, it's like he would, he would lay with him, he would lay on him. They had a very close, very tight, seemed to be a little bit different than the other disciples. But in this moment, in, in, when, when John saw Jesus, what happened? He says, I fell at his feet as though dead. So I couldn't stand. Like seeing him at, in this way, like all I could do is just fall to my knees and worship him. Jesus. He is the returning king when you read chapters 1 through 3. He's the returning king. He's coming back. When you read chapters 4 and 5, another thing you're going to see is that Jesus is the redemptive lamb. He's the redemptive lamb. You're, you're, as you read Revelation, you will see multiple times the lamb being referred to. The lamb, the lamb, the lamb. That's Jesus. He's referred to many times in the passage of Scripture. Listen to what, uh, listen to what John what vision he had. Revelation 5, verse 2. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seal? Now let's pause for just a moment. God is on his throne, and in his, in his right hand, he's got this scroll that has these seals on it. And uh, what is being asked is, Who's worthy? Is there anyone here that can break these seals and open the scrolls? And, and what, you're gonna, what we're going to see is, in verse 3, that, that says this, And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scrolls or to look into it. And John says, I began to weep out loud or loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. John, he's upset. He says, I, I see the scroll. I want to see what's in the scroll, and nobody is worthy. Nobody can open the scroll. It's, it's locked forever until, verse 5, he says, 
And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the only one worthy. He was the redemptive lamb, the only one worthy. And listen to what happens. You keep reading, go to verse 6. Verse 6 says, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb. Now remember that. If you've got a Bible, underline that phrase. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. There's the gospel again, okay? Verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's what Jesus did for all of us. That's what he did. He is the Lamb of God. He is the redemptive Lamb. He is the only one worthy for, for, for John's readers to read this. For people in the ancient times to read, it was the lamb. You saw the lamb. They would begin to remember things like, remember John the Baptist? When he saw Jesus approaching, what did he say? He says, look, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They would, they would behold, that's, that's who he was talking about. They would, they would know things like the Passover and what the lamb does. Remember what the Passover lamb does? When the death angel was going to pass over and, and any home that the death angel would pass over not covered by the blood of the lamb, they would be death. Jesus is the lamb whose blood, when it covered the doors, the death angel would pass over. He is the redemptive lamb. When you read Revelation 4 and 5, remember that, that Jesus is the redemptive lamb. Now, chapter 6 through 18, things get really crazy. Okay, 6 through 18, this is what I want you to see. When you read chapter 6 through 18, I want you to see Jesus, and I want you to see him this way, that Jesus is the righteous judge. He's the righteous judge. You're, you're going to see things like, like hell and fire and, that are falling from the sky. You're going to see things where, where sores are on people and the mark of the beast and the Antichrist and Armageddon and all of this, all of this is... All of this is leading up to Jesus judging the earth. And he's the righteous judge. He's the fair judge. It's, it, it, it's all right, every bit of it. And there's a lot to cover there. And so this is not in your notes, but uh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a highlight from uh, chapter 6 all the way to 18. I'm going to give you some highlights. Write this down. And again, I'm encouraging you, go back and read it. Okay, go back and read it. Look at it for yourself. But just a few highlights, okay? This is, these are some things that you're going to see. For example, in, in Revelation 11 and Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, you're going to see where the temple in Israel is rebuilt for the Jews. There's a temple there right now. There is a temple there. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's on the, the Temple Mount. It's a place called the Dome of the Rock, but hear me, it's not for the Jews. Okay, it, is for the, it is for the Muslims. It's controlled by the Muslims. It's not for the Jews at all. But one day, there's going to be a temple, a new temple that's built there, and it's going to be for the Jews. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll, I'll show you what this looks like right now. This is called the Dome of the, of the Rock, okay? This is a, the temple that exists. It's there right now. I took this just a, a few months ago, and inside, we're not even allowed inside. Only Muslim worshipers are allowed to go inside. But inside, it's believed to be the, um, that covers the rock 
the temple rock or temple mount that that covers the place where you remember back in week one we talked about abraham and we talked about isaac you remember that you you remember that uh, isaac was the promised son to abraham and when god gave him that son god also said i want you to go sacrifice that son and he was testing abraham it's believed to be that this is the location where Abraham went. Abraham went there to, um, to sacrifice his son. It's, it's, it's called Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. But one of these days, one of these days, uh, what's going to happen is the temple is going to be rebuilt for the Jews there. Another thing that's going to happen, I'll show you this, is the Antichrist rises and institutes the mark of the beast now you can read all about that in revelation 13 and revelation 14 and 16 you can read about that as well there um it, it's interesting in luke chapter 21 verse 25 this is what jesus says he said on earth there would be distress of nations and perplexity that's what jesus says in other words, the world will experience a great upheaval and they will not know how to solve it. They, they won't know how to get out of their problems. And when that happens, what's going to happen is an, the Antichrist is going to appear. The Antichrist, he's going to rise up. He's going to emerge as the problem solver. Now, this is what we know about the Antichrist. He's not the problem solver. But remember in the tribulation, there's seven years of tribulation. Remember, there's three and a half years that is a time of peace. Three and a half years where they're going to look at the Antichrist and he's the answer to the world. He's solving all their problems. In fact, what might happen, he may even solve the Middle East problems that they have. He may even bring peace in the Middle East. But what we know is that the final three and a half years of the tribulation, he's not bringing peace. He, he's, he is doing something other than peace. He's going to rise up. He's going to institute things that um, are terrible. Another thing that you're going to see uh, is that God appoints two witnesses to perform miracles and to preach. And you can read about those in chapter 11. And uh, this is incredible. Okay, these two witnesses are coming along and these witnesses have amazing abilities they can they can shut the sky off they can they have power over water to turn it to blood they have power over plagues um, anyone who tries to harm them they have a a special superpower if you think if, if you think captain marvel or thor or or or, or any of the marvel uh superhero characters have power you go read about these two witnesses. In fact, I'm not even going to tell you their superpower, but they have one. Go read it. They have a power. If you come against them, they have a power that they can, they can do something to you, and it's really cool. But when these witnesses come along, 144,000 Jews, Jewish people, are going to be saved. They're going to turn into evangelists. It's going to be amazing when they come go read about it go read about it the next thing that you're going to see re remember we're just hitting highlights is the abomination of desolations and those are the scripture verses that you can read about with the abomination of desolations but here here's the thing the antichrist who they thought was peaceful who they thought was there to to bring in peace he is going to do something he's going to defile the temple he's going to come in and he is going to say i'm god you have to worship me. He's going to set up this, this image of himself, and he is going to go wild. You'll see, if you read this, that he's going to kill two-thirds of the entire Jewish population living in Israel. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to convince world leaders to, to hand him their power. He's going to appear to have complete power. This all happens in the tribulation. But, as you notice at the bottom, the Antichrist is defeated at the battle of Armageddon. 
He's defeated. You can read all about that. Uh, let, let's talk about Armageddon real quick. Um, when you think about Armageddon, this is not a Bruce Willis movie. Okay, it's, it's, not, a, it's not that at all. Uh, Armageddon, it comes from two Hebrew words. One is har, H-A-R, which means mountain. And the other one is Megiddo, okay? Megiddo, which is, um, it's what is, uh, the meaning of it is gathering place. Okay, so mountain gathering place. You could actually, this could literally mean the mount of the assembly. Armageddon. We think of Armageddon as this great war, this great, this place where this war is going to be fought. It's, it's not that at all. In fact, it's just a gathering place. It's a large gathering place. I'll show it to you in just a moment. It's a large gathering place located about 60 miles just north of Jerusalem. And it sits up on this hill or on this mountain. There's literally, there is like 25 different civilizations that have been built one upon another in this location. It's called the Mount, Mount Precipice. I'll show you a picture, Mount Precipice. Mount Precipice. This is, this was a picture that I took from Mount Precipice, and that's looking out into the um, uh, Jezreel, the Valley of Jezreel, okay? That, that valley is where Scripture says one day all the armies of the world are going to come together. They're going to collect together right there in that valley, and they're going to turn their attention towards Jerusalem. Armageddon. It's interesting that this location that you see is located just right outside of Nazareth and where Jesus grew up. And if you know the scriptures, you can go read this later, but in Luke chapter 4, there's a place in Luke chapter 4 where an angry mob attempted to murder Jesus. Why did they do that? He was in his hometown. It's the first time that he declared that he was a Messiah, and it made them mad. So mad that they tried to push him off the top of this mountain, off the cliff. Go read about it. This all happened right, right there. That's Armageddon. And this is all going to happen during the tribulation, okay? Are you with me so far? Now, take some more notes. I'm going to show you real quick. Remember, we're talking about the judgment here, okay? There's three judgments that you're going to look for when you read through Revelation. I don't have time to go through them, but I'm going to show you them right here. Write this down. You've got three judgments. You've got the seal judgments, you've got the trumpet judgments, and you've got the bowl judgments. Now, I've given you some scripture there that you can use to go and refer back to those judgments. This, in these judgments, you're going to see some crazy things happen. Tremendous bloodshed during the seal judgments. Uh, a quarter of the world dies from famine and from, from uh, plagues. In the trumpet judgments, you're, you're going to uh, um, you're see locusts. Locusts that come out with, with uh, they have like, um, they're like a scorpion. They, they, have the, they have the power or the potency of a scorpion. They're poisonous. Locusts. That's scary. They're, they're going to come out. Uh, a, a third of the vegetation will be destroyed. A third of the sea animals will die. A third of the water uh, will be contaminated. A third of the light will be lost. I mean, you just you, you read about it in this in this trumpet judgment. In the bowl judgments, you're going to see sores on people with with the mark of the beast. You're going to see water that turns to blood, and everything in it dies, you're going to see 100-pound, um, like, hailstones that fall from the sky. Can you imagine? I mean, we, you know, if a hailstorm comes up and we get little pebbles or golf ball size, think of the destruction. Imagine what 100 pounds would do. It's all going to happen during this judgment. You know, a, a lot of people would look at this, and we, we went through this last week, a lot of people would look at this and go, but how, how could God do that? How could a loving God do that? That doesn't seem fair. And 
Remember what we said. We've, we've all, we, we probably know someone who has done something incredibly wrong, s- done something that was really bad where they broke a law or they hurt someone and they were not held accountable for it. Maybe that was you and you got away with it. Whenever that happens, we look at that and we go, whoa, hold on a minute, that's not fair. Like we know, we know wrong should be punished. It's like I know a few months ago when I was on my way home from South Carolina visiting uh, someone in a hospital who was under cancer treatment, on my way home through Gaffney when I got pulled over for speeding on Highway 85, was I guilty? Yes. But I also know that I was following a lot of other people that did not get pulled over. Was that fair? No. It was not fair. They should have all got pulled over, but they didn't. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. What we just read about, all these judgments, is where one day there's going to be payment for the sins of the world. All the payment for the sins of those that are not covered by Christ. And it's, it's kind of like God knew this. He knew that one day people would be sitting in church thinking that's not fair. That doesn't seem right. And John heard an angel. Listen, listen to this in Revelation 16, verse 5. It says this, And I heard an angel in charge of the water say, Just are you. O Holy One, who is and was, for you brought these judgments. Jesus is a just God. He's a righteous judge. And one of these days, he's going to set all the wrong right. He's going to do that. And that's what you see here. He's the returning king. He's the righteous lamb. He he is the the, the, uh, righteous judge. And then listen to what he is next uh, in Revelation 19 through 20. Uh, It's what I want you to see Jesus. I want you to see Jesus as Jesus is the reigning warrior. He's the reigning warrior. John said this. Look what he saw in Revelation 19, verse 11 and 12. He says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting is called Faithful and True, And in righteousness, he judges. That's what we just talked about. He's the righteous judge. In righteousness, he judges, and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Now that is cool. Jesus has got a name that nobody knows but Jesus, not even the angels know that name. I don't know what that name could be, but I'm telling you, he's coming. He is the reigning warrior. Verse 14 says, And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on a white horse. Who is the Bible talking about right now? Who is the armies in heaven who were following him on the white horse? That's right. The saved people. You. You. You're coming with him. If you're saved, if you're a Christian, you're coming with him riding on a white horse. Some of you are like, well, I've never ridden a horse. One of these days in eternity, you will. You will, and you're coming back. Jesus is coming back. He is the the reigning warrior, and I want you to see what he does when he comes back, okay? As you read through Revelation, you get to Revelation 20 and 21. Look at what Jesus does. Jesus is restoring what was lost he restores it he brings it all back together john says then then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls remember that's judgment the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying come i will show you the bride who's the bride you're the bride the church is the bride He says, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And some of you guys, you're listening to that going, hold on a minute, I'm going to be a wife one day. Yes, you will 
when Jesus comes back, but boy, don't we want to be, we're the bride of Christ. And verse 10 says, and he carried with, he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God and the city has no need. We talked about this last week. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. Why does it not need any light? Because God is the light, the glory. The Bible says, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. Jesus is the light. And what is He doing? He's coming back and He's restoring. He's restoring what has been lost. He's restoring everything that was, that was undone by sin. He's restoring it. And He's making it all new. So what is the message that God has for us from Jesus? Well, what is Jesus saying to all of us who are waiting for the end times? What is he saying? He's saying the same thing that he was saying before October the 7th. He's saying the same thing that he's been saying since, Re since Genesis all the way to Revelation. He's saying the same thing that he's been saying your entire life. He's saying, come. Come. Listen to what John sees. In verse 17, he says, The Spirit and the bride, bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. You hear, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price just come what's the message what's the message what is he saying he's are you thirsty come come I, I'll, I'll give you something that will quench your thirst I, I will give you something that you'll you'll not find anywhere else some of you you're, you're like you're walking around and you're looking for that that next thing that next thing that that would make your life better that would make you feel like you have a purpose and meaning and direction and everything you go to, everything you turn to, it fails you. Jesus says, come to me. Just, just come. Just come. John says this in verse 20. He says, he who testifies to these things, this is Jesus, says, surely I'm coming soon. And when Jesus said, surely I'm coming soon, John says, amen. So be it. And the church, our response, should be what is written next. And he says, come, Lord Jesus. Come. Is that your response? Come, Jesus. Come. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. See, some of you, you're watching this stuff and you're spiritually, you're, you're thirsty, you're searching. And the message here is to come, come to Jesus, come to him. And my prayer for you is that this series has brought some strength, has brought some comfort to you to know that that's God's word. God sent a word to you from Jesus to come to him. You come. Jesus is restoring everything, everything that has been lost with sin. No matter what you've done in your past, it can be restored through Jesus. All you got to do is come. That's it. Come. Will you bow your heads? Close your eyes. And I want to ask you, for everyone who's not a believer, a follower of Jesus, how does it make you feel to know that the creator of everything, the one that is to come, one day he's coming back for his church, the bride of Christ. He's coming back for us. How does it make you feel to know that he is staying today to come? Like come to him. Come to him. There's some of you... And you're like, 
how do I do that? Like, I, how do I bring my life to him? How do I come to Jesus? Listen, the Bible just says that he is standing on the outside of your heart. He's knocking. And if you would open up your heart and just let him in, he would come in. He'll come in. He'll change you. He'll, he'll save you. He'll forgive your sins. He'll transform your life. And he'll come one day to take you home. And if you're not right with him, you can be. Wherever you are right now, I, I just want to give you that opportunity. Come on, say yes to Jesus. Say yes to him. You say, well, pastor, I don't, I don't what do I do? Okay, listen to me. All you got to do is pray this prayer with me. It's, it's not anything magical. Listen, the real meaning, the real truth comes from your heart. You meaning it. With your heads bowed, your eyes are closed, but your heart is open to God. Why don't you just right now just call out on him and ask him to save you? Just pray this prayer. Just, just say, hey, uh, dear Jesus, go ahead, say his name, Jesus. Please forgive me. I know that I'm a sinner. I, I know I've done bad things. I, I know that there's a penalty for my sin. I, I, I know that. Now I'm asking you to please forgive me of my sins. Go ahead and ask him. Please forgive me of my sins, Jesus, and come into my heart. Go ahead, right there, right where you are. You invite him in. Jesus, come into my heart. I'm turning from my life of sin to a life surrendered to you. Go ahead, tell him that. I'm all yours, Jesus. My life is all yours. If that was your prayer, wherever you are, whether you're seated right here in person or you're watching on the other side of a screen, listen, let me tell you what happened. Jesus just saved you. Your sins are forgiven. Man, you, 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 like your life has been forever changed. Your eternal destiny is heaven. If that was your prayer, wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to do something. As Christians are praying, as Christians are, are, are speaking with God on, on what this is going to mean in their life, they're also praying for you. If you just had that conversation with Jesus, I want to ask you to do something. Wherever you are, would you raise your hand right now? We just raise it up? By you raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I gave my heart, my life to Jesus. Just go ahead right now. Raise it up. Raise it up and hold it up. Yeah, hold it up. Their hands are up. You're not alone. You're not alone. Thank you so much. God bless you. And God bless you back there in the back. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Who else? Just raise your hand. Come on. Come on. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand, let me see it, and you can put it right back down. Thank you. Those of you that are watching on the other side of a screen, you can raise your hand as well. We have hosts that are in the chat room right now. They want to connect up with you. So follow out the links. They're going to put a link right there for you to click. Let us know that today you said yes to Jesus. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm, if you're watching on the other side of a screen, or even if you're here in person, I'm going to ask you to send me a text message. There's going to be a phone number that's going to come up below. You just send me a text and just say, all you got to do is say, I said yes. And if you do that, I will answer you back. I will begin to text message you. We are in this together. We are the family of God. We're the bride of Christ. We're his church. And what you've done today is the very best day of your life. It's the best decision that you could ever make. God, thank you. Amen. And as Pastor Lance said, after the salvation prayer, you are not alone. So if you said yes to Jesus today and you accepted him into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior, we want to walk with you um, in your faith and pray with you and lead you into your next step. So please text the number on the screen right now, whether you're watching live or you're watching throughout the week. Text this number and say, I said yes. Pastor Lance will reach out, will pray with you. And then if you have prayer requests that you would like to share with us, we have a, fa a feature on our Lyft app. Got mixed up there. Um, so download that right now and you can send us your prayer requests so we can be intentionally praying for you throughout this week. Today, Pastor Lance wrapped up our message, message series, my goodness, all about end times. And I truly believe that all of the messages that he shared throughout the past couple of weeks are really important for every believer to hear. So if you have missed out on any of them, I encourage you to go back, catch up on those, and share this link with a friend. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love you, and we'll see you next time.